Hi, my name is Laura, and welcome to my audio version of the General Surgery Neurology EOR Study Guide. The rest of the general surgery topics can be found on my channel, but I'll link them below as well. This review is going to follow the PAEA Neurology portion of the General Surgery End of Rotation Exam Topic List, and I'll timestamp all the topics below in case you'd like to skip around. Let's start off with epidural hematoma. This is a type of brain bleed that occurs between the skull and the dura mater, which is the outer layer of the meninges. As a quick review, the order of the layers, starting from the outside, is the scalp, the skull, dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater, and then the cerebral cortex. So in epidural hematomas, the most common injury pattern is a fracture of the temporal bone of the skull which can tear the middle meningeal artery and cause an epidural hematoma. Presentation can vary, but it's common to see a brief loss of consciousness followed by a lucid interval and then a coma. I remember that epidural hematomas have a lucid period by thinking epi, like adrenaline, keeps you awake. So in epidural hematomas, you're unconscious, but then epi, you wake up before going unresponsive again. It can also present with headache, nausea, vomiting, rhinorrhea, and focal neurological symptoms, like unilateral extremity weakness. Diagnosis starts with a non-contrast CT scan. Actually, all head injuries and strokes start off with a non-contrast head CT. And CT of an epidural hematoma will look like a convex lens-shaped hemorrhage that does not cross the suture lines. Remember, the most common injury pattern is a temporal bone fracture, so the bleed is most often in the temporal area. If the bleed is small and stable, management is observation. But if there's increased intracranial pressure, treatment is mannitol and elevation of the head, use gravity to your advantage, and neurosurgical intervention might be necessary. Next is subdural hematoma, which is another type of brain bleed. Subdurals occur between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater due to a tearing of cortical bridging veins. It's most common in the elderly and most often from blunt head trauma. In those with brain atrophy or shrinkage, like the elderly or chronic alcoholics, these bridging veins are stretched further, so it takes less force to cause a tear and therefore a subdural. Also, because the source of the bleeding is venous, these brain bleeds tend to grow more slowly and they aren't restricted by suture lines, so it's distributed over a larger surface area and there's less pressure buildup. This means the patient might have minimal symptoms or none at all. In fact, elderly patients, those on blood thinners, chronic alcoholics, and others with a higher risk of bleeding typically get a head CT when they present with any kind of head trauma. And this is because they could have a brain bleed but be asymptomatic at the time. But as the blood accumulates, symptoms can include headache, nausea, vomiting, and focal neurologic symptoms, like unilateral extremity weakness. Diagnosis of a subdural hematoma starts with a non-contrast head CT, which will look like a crescent-shaped hemorrhage that can cross suture lines. A subdural is considered acute within two days of the inciting injury. It's considered subacute between two days and two weeks. And it's chronic if the injury was over two weeks ago, but the hematoma is still present. Treatment depends on the severity. If the bleed is small and stable, management is observation. Otherwise, surgical evacuation is indicated. The next type of brain bleed is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which occurs between the arachnoid and pia mater the innermost layer of the meninges. Head trauma is the most common cause overall, but the most common cause of a spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is rupture of a berry aneurysm, normally in the circle of Willis. Certain genetic disorders can predispose individuals to developing these aneurysms, like autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, Marfan syndrome, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Subarachnoid hemorrhages tend to progress quickly, and patients present with a sudden thunderclap headache 
often described as the worst headache of my life. There might also be a loss of consciousness, nausea, vomiting, vision changes, confusion, and meningeal symptoms, but there are not usually any focal neurologic symptoms. Diagnosis starts with a non-contrast head CT first, which might show blood in the ventricular cisterns, inner hemispheric fissures, and within the sulci. But if CT is negative, and there was no trauma, a lumbar puncture is done next to look for xanthochromia, which is red blood cells in the cerebrospinal fluid, as well as increased intracranial pressure. Lumbar puncture is contraindicated in traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, though, due to risk of brain herniation. Initial treatment is supportive, but re-bleeding is very common in subarachnoid hemorrhages, so surgical aneurysm repair is normally indicated. Patients are also given a calcium channel blocker to prevent post-traumatic vasospasm of the subarachnoid vasculature, which is a complication that can occur two days to two weeks later and cause cerebral ischemia. Now let's move on to changes in speech. There are a variety of changes that can occur, and an even wider variety of reasons, so let's simplify this with some definitions. Aphasia is an inability to understand or express language due to neurologic damage to specific regions of the brain. A similar term, dysphagia, means partial loss of language. Some causes of aphasia and dysphagia include stroke or TIA, MS, intracranial hemorrhage, chronic alcoholism, and even migraine headaches can cause transient aphasia. Dysarthria is a defect of the motor speech system due to a neurological injury of the motor part. So in patients with dysarthria, the muscles used for speech are weak and poorly controlled, and they can be difficult to understand. Their speech might sound slow or slurred, and some causes of dysarthria include stroke, TBIs, toxic and metabolic conditions, brain tumors, cerebral palsy, Guillain-Barre syndrome, intracranial hypertension, and degenerative diseases like Parkinsonism, Huntington's, ALS, and MS. One last symptom to mention is hoarseness. This can occur particularly after thyroid surgeries if the recurrent laryngeal nerve is injured. Unilateral damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve can cause hoarseness, while bilateral damage can actually cause aphonia, or loss of speech, and potentially airway obstruction. Now on to changes in vision. The most common cause of post-operative ocular injury is corneal abrasion, which is why we protect the eyes and try not to let the patient rub them. Complete or partial vision loss after surgery can be related to direct surgical trauma, embolic events, acute anemia, hypotension, and ischemia, such as in ischemic optic neuropathy. Next is motor and or sensory loss. Motor and sensory loss is often the result of neuropathy or spinal cord injuries. Causes of neuropathy vary greatly and can include diabetes, alcohol, vitamin B12 deficiency, vitamin B6 toxicity, Lyme's disease, vasculitis, amyloidosis, and medications like chemotherapy. Spinal cord injuries, on the other hand, are classified into a few different categories. Anterior cord syndrome, central cord syndrome, posterior cord syndrome, complete cord transection, and brown saccard syndrome. Central cord syndrome is the most common incomplete spinal cord syndrome, and it occurs with injury to the central gray matter of the cord. This will most often be a hyperextension injury, such as in a motor vehicle accident, but it can also be caused by falls, GSWs, tumors, and cervical spinal stenosis. Patients present with loss of movement, pain, and temperature sensation, more severe in the upper extremities than in the lower ones. It's sometimes described as a shawl distribution. And then proprioception, vibration, and pressure sensation are preserved. 
Anterior cord syndrome occurs with an anterior spinal cord injury, which is most commonly the result of a vertebral body burst fracture from flexion. It can also be due to anterior spinal artery injury or anterior cord compression. Patients present with loss of movement, pain, and temperature sensation below the level of injury, but they're still able to feel position, vibration, and pressure. brown saccard syndrome is a result of a unilateral hemisection of the spinal cord. It's most commonly due to penetrating injuries, but it can also be caused by tumors. Patients present with loss of movement, vibration, and proprioception on the same side as the injury, and loss of pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side of the injury. Next, complete cord transection occurs when the spinal cord is completely disrupted. There's a complete loss of movement and sensation below the level of the injury. And lastly, there's posterior cord syndrome, but it's rare. It occurs when there's damage to the posterior cord or posterior spinal stenosis, and it results in a loss of proprioception and vibratory sense. Pain and light touch are preserved, and there are no motor deficits. The last topic is vascular disorders. And vascular disorders here is primarily referring to carotid disease, which is stenosis or narrowing of the carotid arteries caused by atherosclerotic plaque buildup. Risk factors include hyperlipidemia, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and older age. Carotid disease can be asymptomatic, or it can present with dizziness, transient visual disturbances called amaurosis fugax, unilateral muscle weakness or paresthesia, tinnitus, aphasia, TIA, or stroke. Patients with carotid disease often have peripheral artery or coronary artery disease as well. Physical exam can show motor or sensory deficits, and a carotid brewery might be heard if there's more than 60% stenosis. Diagnosis is done with a duplex Doppler ultrasound, which will determine the level of carotid stenosis. More than 50% stenosis is classified as moderate, and more than 70% is severe. Treatment involves managing underlying cardiovascular disease, and smoking cessation if the patient smokes cigarettes. All patients should be on a statin, and symptomatic patients should receive antiplatelet therapy, like clopidogrel. If the stenosis is severe, greater than 70%, or the patient has experienced a stroke or TIA, then surgery can be considered. First-line surgical intervention is a carotid end arterectomy, but if the patient cannot tolerate this, then carotid artery stenting can be done. And that wraps up the neurology portion of the General Surgery EOR Exam Study Guide. If you're listening to these videos in order, the next section is Urology and Renal, which I'll link below once it's up. If you're listening as these videos roll out, there's a whole lot of EOR content getting uploaded at once, so stay tuned, subscribe to the channel, and thank you so much for listening! Happy studying, and I'll see you in the next video!